Hi everyone, I'm Jennifer Hancock and this is um, Teaching Values in the Classroom, the new uh, series that we're doing at the International Humanistic Management Association. Um, I am going to mute everyone. Uh, and uh, so today our guest is David from Duquesne. Hi David. Hello everyone. Um, why don't you introduce yourself and then um, get into, uh, we'll have like 15 minutes of, 15, 20 minutes of you presenting how you teach values in the classroom. Um, and then we'll open it up for questions and discussions. So take it away, David. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Jen. And I am uh, proud to be a part of this uh, new series for International Humanistic Management Association. My name is David Wasileski. I am uh, a uh, professor of business ethics at Duquesne University in Pittsburgh, and that's where I'm uh, resting in place right now. I hope you're all uh, doing well and are staying safe. Uh, I also am uh, a research professor on the faculty at ICN Business School in Nancy, France. So uh, with these affiliations, it's uh, been a pleasure to interact with some of the humanistic management folks and be a part of this community. I serve as the uh, president of the U.S. chapter of the International Humanistic Management Association. And uh, I also am the executive director of the Vera Institute for Ethics and Business at Duquesne University, which is part group. So I uh, have some slides uh, prepared uh, to sort of talk to you today about how I go about teaching business ethics to students and get them prepared for the workplace. And I, uh, in, in part of that is obviously some, some values and value discoveries. But uh, I want today, I, I will present this in sort of an informal way. And I uh, welcome a lot of participation in the last part of the hour. So please feel free to put questions in the chat and uh, we can take uh, verbal questions as we go later on. So let me share my screen. Can you all see that? Okay, hopefully this will go, there we go. So, uh, this uh, being the first in the series, um, just uh, sort of want to go through my approach. And I think uh, to understand my approach, it's a little bit, I'd say, less traditional of an approach to teaching ethics in business school than perhaps most that are dictated in from different textbooks. Uh, I don't like always using a textbook. Um, I like to bring other types of reading in, and I'll show you some of the books that I uh, bring into the classroom. But um, my approach, while I, I find it's very important to teach the moral philosophies and the values that are associated with those philosophies for making ethical decisions, my focus is mainly on the psychology behind making decisions. So I'm more interested in understanding people's tendencies, why people make decisions the way they do. And I tell my students, there are corrupt corporate executives all around the world, and you're going to have to spend your entire careers navigating around them. But, and, and there are bad apples theories associated with those kinds of people, and, and we develop some of our ethics material from understanding these corrupt individuals. Sociopaths really aren't what interests me. What interests me is the rest of us. When we have, we've been raised with fantastic values, a strong upbringing. We understand the ethical principles. We understand morality and embrace it. And we, we are truly decent. People. Why do we still make irresponsible decisions? So I ask you rhetorically to think uh, if you feel that you're an ethical person, have you ever made an irresponsible decision? And I, when I present my students with that question, they, they think, well, yeah, I think I am a good person, but making bad choices sometimes. What is causing us to do that? So this is sort of my approach to, to the course. Now, trying to advance here. 
my slide, there we go. So the starting points that hold in our school, and I think a lot of it is dictated by uh, accreditation agencies like AACSB and Equus and things like this, EMBA, uh, what do you want your students to look like after graduation? And it, it sounds sort of like a vulgar question to me, you know, are we trying to manipulate them to look a certain way? No, not at all. I, I step back from this and understand that we really just have to understand what do we feel that they must know? And how, in terms of ethics and values, how would we like them to behave in the workplace? I'm in uh, Duquesne University in Pittsburgh, which is in the city center of Pittsburgh. So we have a lot of interaction with the corporate uh, partners and uh, corporate uh, headquarters in this in the Western Pennsylvania and constantly are asking for students that are aware of the implications of their decisions teach them how to make responsible decisions so that mandates the importance of an ethics course that incorporates a humanistic management uh, as well and I do incorporate that in my course so fundamentally, how do you know as, as a professor that you've done your job? And this is really the starting point of where we have to take this discussion. So part of the journey of a course, I feel, is self-discovery. And this is where students really become aware of what values that they have and what values um, they tend to nurture in their everyday life. So referring to some of the Bentham and Mill, they talk about true happiness, and it comes with meaning and having meaningful work. And part of that meaningful work is to treat people with dignity and well-being. So understanding yourself in space and how you fit into promoting well-being and, and finding a career and finding life with meaning is a very important aspect of courses like this. So I try to focus on nurturing positive emotions to achieve better outcomes, positive principles and values. Classes, I try to emphasize the self and its, his or her self's place in the world. I have a hyperlink here to uh, the Positive Psychology Center and uh, University of Pennsylvania, the hedonic treadmill that uh, we tend to always get back to a certain level of happiness despite our fluctuations of uh, mood and, and temperament. And I think that can also apply to values. And I often start my course by giving it's the defining issues test, which measure, measures your cognitive moral reasoning. And what level, how do you perceive your world? It's a sociomoral perspective test on how you perceive the world and issues in the world. So do you only look at things individualistically, sort of an egoist? Are you thinking more in terms of your social group or cultural group? Or are you thinking in terms of the decisions you make affecting a greater body public, some of the world and society? And this defining issues test gives you a lot of other details about uh, how you think and what your values are. But this is part of the self-discovery part of, I think, a, an important ethics course. So the other part is, I think, teaching students to think. So what do, answering that question, well, how do I know if I did my job properly? If I can get them to think and not take things for granted or at face value, then I think I did at least part of my job. So part of it is their own self-discovery, but part of it is critical thinking. And there's this, uh, Indian philosopher Jay Krishnamurti that uh, teaches uh, about teaching and learning. And I discovered his work and decided that there were some aspects to it that absolutely are important for our students. And he's quoted as saying, I don't depend on anybody to find what is true and what is false. He asks us not to accept, but to observe for yourself, learn about it, but learn by watching all these implications of analysis. So I present this to my students before I give them the moral philosophies. I teach them relativism. Uh, I teach them uh, even objectivism from Ian Rand. 
I uh, teach them, of course, utilitarianism, act utilitarianism, rule utilitarianism. I give them Kantian ethics as well as relative and justice fairness. I try to tell them that each one of these theories is written in a certain historic context, certain time period, a couple of the the justifiable, the morally justifiable uh, universal theories that we use were written during the Industrial Revolution. So think about what the world looked like then, what different does it look now? Now we tend to think these theories are timeless. They are very stoic, they do have a lot of value today, but these are written by fallible human beings. So I asked the students to criticize. Don't just say, okay, this is, this is, theory is right, this is how it should work. I encourage them to raise their hand and say, that's not right, that's not how I've experienced it, this doesn't make sense to me. And for them to make some sort of you know, higher order critical thinking of the theories that uh, are presented to them and normally in textbooks as being completely uh, correct and timeless. We must understand that that's not the case. Oops. Uh, back. So the learning objectives of, of course, it's, it's pretty uninteresting here. I'm not going to spend time on this slide, but um, I do try to give them exposure to critical thinking frameworks, trying to get them to come up with some sound judgments. Part of this is they have to become uncomfortable, have to become comfortable with uncertainty. And in an ethics course, if you leave more confused than when you enter, then I think I've done my job a little bit because it's gotten you to think, it's gotten you to think that there isn't just a black and white objective solution, which a lot of rational models teach us to uh, assume that there is gonna be this optimal outcome. And certainly this is from the homo economicus assumptions that humanistic management refutes and says that we have to focus more on the whole human. And that is definitely a big part of this course. Now, I want them to be very aware and be able to recognize common ethical challenges. Obviously, you can't resolve an ethical issue if you don't know what you're facing one. So you have to have some moral perception. So this, again, goes back to what I said before about the psychology of, of ethics. This is where I'm really focused. You cannot separate the psychology from uh, the philosophy from the psychology. So even the moral philosophies have all kinds of underlying cognitive bias in them. We perceive dilemmas differently. We, we perceive the, the consequences differently. We, we have moral blind spots based on our own experiences and our own biases, and the heuristics we use. So we have to be aware that two people facing the same problem are going to view it differently. And that's going to create some uncertainty and, and we cannot necessarily predict decisions reliably because of those kinds of issues. So the ethical decision-making framework I want to show you, one of the big aspects of these courses, you, I feel you have to break down the barrier between the professor and the student. I learned this early on. You absolutely have to do whatever you can to make them comfortable speaking up. This course works the best. Teaching ethics and values works the best and can only work if there's some sort of uh, conversation. There has to be a dialogue with the students. So people have to be comfortable under, uh, listening to other people's opinions, giving their own opinions, sharing them, and learning from one another. Part of being at university is learning all these different opinions and learning, you know, most uh, respectable people respectfully disagree. So we, we can learn and expand our views of issues. And this is so important for any sort of uh, normative class like ethics and values. So my approach, I already told you, I take a psychological approach and I try to get them to see their place in trying to create a more ordered society, uh, trying to make their mark on the world and make a difference even in a small team in an organization, that kind of decision, that kind of interaction does make a difference. So if we can all incrementally do this sort of thing, this is going to improve society and this isn't society. 
So I do promote a humanistic management approach to ethics and values. This is sort of how I teach the course. I look at it as a roadmap. Up here at the top, you have the ethical decision-making model. It varies in length. You can see ethical decision-making models in some textbooks that are 13 steps long. It really can be collapsed into this. You form a moral awareness so you know that an issue exists. You will make a moral judgment based on the moral philosophies that we offer from utilitarianism and Kant and justice, these sorts of things. And then from what those theories sort of tell you to do, and what I ask the students to do is to critically examine those theories and maybe create a, a hybrid integrated approach with multiple theories, you have an intent to behave a certain way. But this is where I spend most of my time in the course. How many of you have intended to do something going into a situation and you end up behaving completely different than you intended? I mean, it, it is a common tendency. It is a, just a common state of being human. So I spend most of my course right here, understanding what gets us from what happened between behavior and intent. And these are the things that we talk about. We talk about different characteristics of individuals, looking at moral reasoning and different uh, biases that we have, different values. This is why the self-reflection uh, and, and self-discovery is so important to know what your values are and what are important to you. There are different characteristics of organizations that are important. So different cultures and pressures that we have will affect how we make decisions. And the issue itself will affect how we make decisions too. So I have a little story example that might get us into this a little bit more. So just to emphasize the importance of the interactive classroom environment to integrate views and ideas of various members of an organization. So this is when you, you're preparing them for the workplace, they're gonna be put in a group of people that are of diverse backgrounds and they need to respect and understand different opinions in order to make better decisions. They, I try to teach them that they should submit to the lot of the situation rather than to each other. So always know the context. So that's why a dialogue, understanding these issues more dynamically is so important. And having them understand this principle that strength comes together, it's not individually. We, we work best in teams. We make the best meaningful decisions in teams. And when you go into the workplace, you have to work with one another. So you have to understand other people's viewpoints and get them to understand yours. So pushback is a must in the classroom. And I, I'm just like all of us, uh, right now we're experiencing this uh, online education because of COVID and the lockdowns. <clears throat> and getting the interaction on Zoom is a little bit more challenging than when you're face to face and see the whites of the students' eyes. But uh, it is possible with these technologies and even in an online environment, you have to encourage this pushback. It's best for learning, in my opinion, my humble opinion. So moving on to some of the things that I, I do, here's an example of uh, one of those situation context uh, items that get people to think a little bit more deeply. This is from uh, Lawrence Kohlberg's research on cognitive moral development. And it was a little vignette that he gave his participants to find out um, the reasons behind a decision that they would make. So very quickly, um, there's this fictitious story that uh, in a small village in Europe, a, a woman was dying because she was very sick. There was one drug the doctor said might save her. This medicine was discovered by a man living in that same village. It cost him 400 US dollar equivalent to make, but he charged $4,000 for it. And this woman's husband, Heinz, tried to borrow enough money to buy the drug. He went to everyone he knew to borrow the money, but he could only get about half the money to buy the drug. He tried to go to the local savings and loan. He didn't have enough collateral to the credit rating to get the money for the remainder. He begged this druggist for some sort of amnesty. My wife is dying. Please, I, I need the drug. Can you give me an IOU? I'll pay you over time. The inventor of the drug said, no, I made the drug and I'm going to make money from it. So the question is, should Heinz steal the drug? Now, 
whether Heinz steals a drug or not isn't what is most important, and it's not what matters. What matters for Kohlberg and for the discussion is why. You can think of very principled reasons for stealing the drug, saving a person's life, uh, making sure that uh, this right to life is respected, so you can get into some rights theories with a situation like this. But you can also come up with very principled reasons for not stealing the drug. And the things that uh, some students come up with are, are fascinating, what they, how they link the decision to certain types of morality. But some sophisticated uh, reasons for not stealing the drug would involve um, not putting this person out of business so he could create drugs to help people in the future. So it's getting them to think about future generations and beyond just the dying woman, but how the greater society could actually be uh, involved in all these decisions as well. So I, I give them these kinds of vignettes and I should say that uh, I start every class period with a little segment called In the News and I encourage students to bring news clippings that relate to business decisions and ethics, business and society, social uh, decisions. And uh, I start every class trying to relate classroom material to things that are happening in the news. And I never have a trouble, never have any trouble finding things on a day-to-day -day basis. There are things in the news all the time. So there's all kinds of fodder for our discussions. Um, David, you got about uh, three to five minutes left. That's fine. I, um, Jen, when she was organizing this whole thing uh, with the fellows and all, I was told that some examples of assignments that uh, would be helpful too. And maybe some of this also will come out in the discussion. But um, I try this, I, I try to get people to understand the idea of moral intensity too. So again, another psychological sort of variable. But how intense, how intensely do you perceive an, uh, an ethical issue to be? The reason this construct is important is because studies have shown empirically that if you, find, if you are faced with an ethical issue and you f feel it is so morally intense that it is just laden with ethical con content and that it's just so important to resolve it in an ethical way, you will spend more cognitive effort to resolve it in an ethical way. So it's important to get people to perceive issues as being morally intense. So I get students as an assignment to identify some sort of unethical behavior in the organization, like sexual harassment, and illustrate how a company would address that. But not just with the policy, but how it would affect the employees' perceptions of the ethical issue as being morally intense. The idea is that uh, if someone feels that sexual harassment is so morally wrong in its intensity, they're going to be less likely to engage in that behavior. You're not going to get everyone. There'll still be those sociopaths, but you've got to get those people to perceive how to, how to, that that issue is wrong, something that they never really thought of before. I do other things too. I have them come up with a uh, museum curator project. We can talk about this more per your interest in the, in the uh, question and answer period. But I have students curate their own uh, art exhibit that is supposed to convey some sort of understanding of some issue. You know, an example, I have art book here from a, a local museum in Pittsburgh, Pastures Green and Dark Satanic Mills. This landscape exhibition that was held a couple years ago and has traveled around the world shows uh, English landscape with uh, before and after the Industrial Revolution and what it has actually done to society. So there are some very beautiful scenes, but also some scenes that are really heart-wrenching based on uh, how industry has taken over. So it's getting people to view the effects of human activity and the Anthropocene on society. So I want students to find some sort of ethical issue and come up with a series of artworks and put them together and curate something to get people to perceive that issue differently, to make a, an emotional connection to that ethical issue. So this success with this assignment and students seem to really love it. And finally, one other thing I do is uh, group debates. I have them get into groups and debates issues. These are some of the most recent ones that we've talked about. Obviously, there are new issues associated with COVID, but these are ones from I, I've used in the past. I let them go into all kinds of social issues, even things like decriminalization of marijuana, 
just to show that they understand both sides of the issue and can argue their side of the issue. We have them flip a coin and they, they're on the pro side of euthanasia or they're on the con side of euthanasia and they have to make arguments to win the debate on either side and they have to use ethical arguments for it. So again, it's another one of those critical thinking exercises that makes it a little bit more personal for them with the issue. You want to make this ethics and values very personal and that will make it more important to them and more memorable. So I can get into that later uh, uh, just to keep us on time. I just uh, want to thank you for listening and uh, can take any questions here. Let me stop my share. Great, David. Thank you so much for that. Um, instead of unmuting people, I'm going to ask the questions that we've got from the chat room. So if you have a question, please post it in the chat room. Um, the first question is from Simona Brickers. She wants to know what book uh, by Krishnamurti did you reference earlier? And just so everyone knows, we will be posting the video. We will hopefully get the slide share from David. And I usually create a blog post that includes all the links to the resources that he's mentioned. So, David? Which sure, the, uh, the book is The Awakening of Intelligence. If you can see it on my uh, chat, I can, or on my uh, camera, I can uh, put it in the chat as well. It's from the 1950s. Um, also from Simona is what techniques do you use to break down the barriers between students and teachers and please give some examples. Oh gosh, you know, um, a colleague of mine um, at Duquesne, Jim Weber has uh, used a phrase uh, has resonated with me. You have to go in the student's door to get them to come out yours. And I thought it was kind of a cool phrase and then maybe didn't understand what it meant at first. And I remember teaching at the University of Pittsburgh. I was sort of given a baptism by fire that uh, I was, one of my first teaching experiences was to teach the, the CATS MBAs. So this top ranked uh, MBA program in business, very finance oriented. And I was to teach them ethics. So I got in there and it, in this situation, they were livid that they had to sit for an ethics course. They wanted another finance course. They thought there was nothing of value in this. So I had to go in their door with that and realized very early on that the next 12 weeks was going to be an absolute waste of everyone's time, including my own, if I didn't get to where they were. So one of the things you have to do to get participation is to find out where they are. And I asked a lot of questions, okay, what bothers you about ethics? What is, what is, your, what, what is uh, your assumptions? And they thought that they already knew it. You can't teach it. So then I had to change my course to get them to understand the importance of ethics. So I gave them a lot of statistics about the financial uh, responsibility connected with social responsibility, that there was a correlation there, that sort of thing. Um, I had to speak their language and you have to do that on the fly. One, so practically, how do you go about doing that? Um, I think it helps uh, to be very conversational, not be, uh, such a figurehead at the, at the head of the room where at the lectern and you're telling them what you know. Don't point at them and tell them what they should or should not do. That's not what an ethics course is about. It's about understanding the implications of all these issues. Once you take that away that you're not going to uh, moralize them, then I found that sometimes the, the barrier comes off where they're more willing to share. You can try early on breaking them into small groups to get them to talk and then walking around the room, that sort of thing. And then eventually when you have the whole class together, my classes are typically 35 to 45, they will speak. You'll still get a few people that are reluctant, but if you have 
uh, just even a small percentage, a quarter of them speaking, you're going to have a very dynamic, interactive environment. Great. Um, as the moderator, I'm going to reserve the right to ask a follow-up question or <laughs> to that. Um, so, with you, you mentioned something in your talk about helping them become comfortable with the uncertainty of morality, I guess. Um, and I was wondering how you help people get into that comfort with what is for a lot of people really intellectually distressing, the, the, the concept of uncertainty. Yeah, it's a great question. And I think um, it's part of human to be comfortable with uncertainty. So it's not something that's very easy to overcome, but letting them know that it's okay, that um, you're going to make a more responsible and defensible decision if you look at the situation and the context and with the information that you're given at a present moment, the moment that you have to make the decision, you pull the trigger on that decision, you have to be comfortable with that and comfortable with the fact that some of the consequences may not be what you anticipated. We try to safeguard for that as much as possible, um, but we have to encourage them to realize that we're all fallible human beings doing the best we can. And cognitively, if you look at uh, the psychology literature, humans are very poor at uh, making predictions. So uh, we, uh, we have to, just become aware that that is part of the human condition. And I uh, just try to encourage comments in class that, okay, students will tend to be like, well, no, this is the right way. Like, Hein should steal the drug, no, no question about it. And I'll be like, okay, someone else, does someone have another opinion about it? Then all of a sudden someone says, well, I'm not sure I'd steal the drug. Well, why not? And then they say, well, I'm not comfortable stealing people's property. So now we have a more complicated issue there. So now the people that thought for sure it was a good thing to steal the drug, now they're less convinced. Oh, God, there are other ways of looking at this. And I just try to keep enforcing it's okay. It's okay. We come from these different perspectives here, and you'll get different results. So I just uh, try to nurture the fact that uh, it's not there's not one single best answer. You know, to be honest, uh, when, when I assign papers where they resolve dilemmas, I, I tell them, take comfort in the fact of this uncertainty. Uh, take comfort in the fact that things are not black and white. So uh, I'm not looking for one right answer in this paper. There are many right answers. It's how you apply the thinking and the logic. And so that brings them a little bit of peace that they're, if they get it wrong, they, uh, they're they not going to get a bad grade. Very good. The next question is from Jesse Hines. How do you help students discover agency and their own voice around their values as they discover who they are through new experiences, especially if when those new values come into conflict with previous values, quote unquote, given to them through family, religion, or other community memberships? Let's see. So... Let me make sure I understand your question. Actually, if Jen doesn't mind, Jesse, would you mind unmuting yourself and kind of giving me a little bit more detail on what you're asking here? Yeah, um, thank you. Uh, it's so a great question, and I, I just don't make sure I'm answering it. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, thank you. So much of your talk has really resonated. Um, and so I was just kind of thinking about the piece where you talk about, you know, the self discovery and helping students understand their values. And I guess it's kind of a two part question. You know, one is just kind of in general, how do you help students discover their values? And then related to that is the question I put in the chat of, you know, I think when I think about teaching values to undergraduate students, which I have done in the past, it 
I found it a little challenging. You know, it's just kind of easy for students to get into this. Okay, I have this assignment to complete. I have to name my top five values and kind of go through this assignment. And, you know, how do you really encourage them to discover those values and think about what they might be as they're in this liminal experience at college and discovering who they are and that might be changing and it may even be taking them in a different direction than the values that they see with their peer groups or their family or other communities that they've been a part of for such a long time in their life. Does that help? Yeah, it, it helps, but it's, uh, it's very complicated and a very sophisticated question. I appreciate it. Uh, you know, uh, very, with a lot of humility, I mean, I, I do the best I can and what I think I can get out of them. I do find that some of those self-assessment tests from uh, Martin Seligman Center is one example. I, I can post these slides and I have a link, hyperlink to his center. You can download a lot of his self-assessment tests for free. And then you uh, score them yourselves too. So I give those to students so they see what, uh, you know, terminal and instrumental values from Rokeach are most important to them. And I make sure that I keep it private so um, no one's embarrassed about what, who they are and what is important to them. So I just want them to be self-aware of it. Then I teach, I spend time on this idea of cognitive moral development and that defining issues test from uh, James Rest that uh, operationalizes and, and measures Kohlberg's theory on the different stages of development from you know, just a, a punishment obedience stage to law and order to social group to more principled. Part of that theory, what makes it interesting is, okay, the students will know that predominantly maybe they're at a law and order stage. So it, it implies certain values associated with it. They're very uh, rules-based. They have uh, certain uh, terminal values related to justice and things like this. Fine. But what we try to teach them is to think more broadly into post-conventional reasoning, uh, higher order values, higher order principles uh, related to global social contract and utility and uh, global human rights and things like this. If they find themselves at a stage four um, out of six stages, law and order. The theory is very clear, and we have a lot of empirical evidence that I teach in class that with some education and exposure to different ways of thinking and those higher order principles, you can raise your reasoning. And part of that is not rejecting your previous values, but at least expanding on those values. So it is possible cognitively for us to expand our value sets and our perspectives on things. And I try to approach it through that cognitive role development theory. So they know where they are, what values seem to be most important to them, which they probably always knew but never articulated, but now they have the, the language. And then they see that they're at a certain stage, but they can actually raise up with certain education. And... Uh, it, it seems to resonate with them. They they want they want to be at a higher stage, so there seems to be motive there. Very cool. Um, so the next question is <laughs> by Gerald Farias. Do you have to deal with conflicts with values discussed implicitly in other courses and the perspectives you take? And I don't know if we need to unmute Gerald so he can explain Maybe, that question. Uh, would you mind? <laughs> I'm unmuting him. Oh, I just muted him again. Gerald? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Hi. Uh, yeah, hi, David. I, I, I just said, uh, I, I wonder, <laughs> I mean, the maximizing shareholder wealth, for instance, on one side versus, uh, versus the stakeholder perspective. But uh, there are, I think you touched it to some extent with the MBA course you talk, talked about. But I was just wondering, uh, there is a normative perspective to this, as well as uh, what is kind of perspective. And uh, uh, I, I just wonder how, 
we bridge those kinds of perspectives and how you how you deal with that uh, in in ways that uh, like you brought up examples about the Anthropocene and and things like that and all those kind of at least to my mind maybe it's a narrow perspective from my point of view uh, kind tend to point in one direction uh, or within within a narrow range of human behaviors to to change things uh, and so then on a broader perspective then we have this more open kind of discussion about what's right and what's wrong i think uh the potential for some from the normative to to the descriptive i guess uh raises some tensions and i was just wondering how those surface and uh i don't know if i made myself clear but no, no, I, I, I love your question, and uh, these are these are sort of philosophy of science issues to to debate and and talk about for a long, long time. Uh, I'm <clears throat> I'm reminded of a horrifying teaching experience that I had in France a few years ago. I'm this uh, little American from Pittsburgh coming in there. They asked me at my school to teach the mainly French students in the room uh, about corporate social responsibility. So I go in there with my American centric view and I, I give them this. And I'll never forget, uh, it was earlier in my teaching experience, so I was absolutely horrified when it happened. He raises his hand and, and says, well, that's, that's bullshit here in, in France, it's like this. And he said, uh, you know, social responsibility uh, is, is more of a moral obligation for the, for the companies and you're presenting it from this perspective. And I stood there and I said, you know what? You're absolutely right. I'm coming in here with my own blinded American view very ignorantly to the rest of your cultures. Here in my country, corporate social responsibility means something completely different than what it means in your countries. You have a more socialist uh, society, uh, more uh, social benefits given to you by the government. We depend so much on our benefits and retirement and our insurance and everything based on our corporation. So the whole idea of a concept means something different in, in the United States than it would in some of the more socialist oriented countries in Europe and around the world. <laughs> that again taught me go in one door and try to bring them out the other. You know, I, one thing I'll do is if I need to start, and maybe this is wrong, maybe this isn't a good thing to do. If I have to start with the business case for social responsibility, meaning to those finance students at the University of Pittsburgh, I'm telling you, I was telling you about that there are financial benefits to being socially responsible. Then I don't mind starting there. At least get them to think about social responsibility in their terms, at least get them to think about the concept. Then start showing them some examples. One is a classic, it sounds embarrassing that we still use the case, but it's in those textbooks and I think it's still relevant, but the Ford Pinto case from the United States back in 1971. Ford claims that they did a utilitarian analysis. This is a morally defensible universal theory. And if you look at, I, I will post the information that they looked at to make the decision to actually release the car to market without fixing it, where thousands of people died and got it burned and it really injured. And they quantified life with the insurance and legal costs. So they, they did a cost benefit analysis like any strategy student would do, but they quantified human life in terms of the number of department of transportation accidents they predicted, the legal costs they predicted, and the insurance costs they predicted. And they kind of the metric, a multiplier. And they decided that that would be cheaper than fixing the problem first. I find that when you show stories like that, and there are many others, those that first 
only saw the business case for social responsibility, now became horrified because it became a little bit more personal to them about human life. I find the way to bridge the normative and the descriptive is to try to personalize the material to the point where they feel uh, more human, that it, that it could happen to them, that it's, it's something that's a little bit closer to them. And moral intensity construct too, we can talk about this offline, but uh, there's a proximity variable in terms of how we evaluate issues. And empirically, it's shown that the more close you feel to an ethical situation, an ethical issue, the more uh, likely you are to resolve the issue in a more responsible manner. So again, it's how close you feel to the issue. And I think the business case keeps you at arm's length, but if you can bring in some of those normative concepts to show the consequences to someone like you or someone who, whom you love, it may resonate with them a little bit more. And, and Gerard said that the Boeing uh, Max 30, 737 Max is a similar sort of case. Um, I want to get to both of these. Elise Jones and David Greenway asked similar questions, um, and I'm going to paraphrase them for them because I think it's basically the same question. But for those people not teaching an ethics course, but would like to integrate ethics into a regular business management course um, and or a decision making course or a strategy course, whatever the course is, do you have advice and suggestions on how they can infuse moral elements or ethical elements into those sorts of courses? Uh, you know, this is one of those old um, debates too with the accreditation agencies. Um, do you have an ethics standalone course or do you integrate it in throughout the curriculum? And the uh, sort of uh, answer that uh, people sort of came up with is, well, you gotta do both. Okay, I believe that too. I believe that standalone ethics courses are very important. They give you a real basis and open minds. But I also believe it should be integrated across the curriculum. So this is something that um, we're all charged to do. I think um, if you look in organizational behavior, uh, textbooks and courses and decision-making courses, there's always usually one chapter on ethics. I think you can integrate it uh, in almost any discipline by looking at the issues associated with that discipline. So I've advised finance faculty who are usually pretty, this is very unfair, but uh, sometimes you get some pushback that uh, I don't need to do this in my course. You bring up some finance ethics issues and have students strategically resolve them, you're going to get some ethical discussion in the classroom. Same with accounting, uh, you know, a discipline that you wouldn't normally think is, uh, should have a, a whole ethics uh, curriculum associated with their ethics module. Absolutely, I have an accounting degree I, I, as well, and you think about the different uh, accounting issues and, and uh, reporting issues that are transparency and, and the principles that relate to ethics can be applied to accounting as well marketing disciplines. Think about all the decision making in uh, manipulating consumer behavior and the ethical issues associated with that. Eye tracking with RFID tags. When you walk into a store, they're tracking your information. There are all kinds of ethical issues there too that all come into play for different case studies and decisions. So I think ethics can be applied to really any discipline. If you're teaching a decision making course, I think you've uh, suggested uh, a lot of these uh, ethical decision-making models are quite relevant and very consistent with basic decision-making models as well. And I'm happy to talk to you offline about some suggestions if you want to get into more detail. Um, you know, moderator prerogative, I want to um, ask a question to follow up on that. Um, it's, everyone has a moral framework they're working from. So all teachers are coming into the classroom with their own preferences for how things resolve. We're obviously the International Humanistic Management Association. So we're coming in with humanistic ethics from the get-go. Um, how do you balance your own moral philosophy while helping create space for your students to both learn about it but not be um, proselytized to? <laughs> Uh, that's a great question. I, um, I, I don't know where I 
learned this, but from the start, I am very careful not to provide my own leading opinions on my stance on issues. And what's helped is uh, as the country's become more polarized politically, um, instructors and professors are encouraged not to sort of expound any sort of uh, political view in the classroom. Mm -hmm. So I've applied that for my own ethics. Um, I, it's easier for me because I have a very complicated ethics. <laughs> I'm not solely utilitarian or solely Kantian. I, I get so confused about what to apply that I usually use a very pluralistic method anyway. So I, what I'll do is if I present one resolution or one viewpoint on an issue that could be perceived as a resolution, I always make sure that I provide a different perspective or different approach to the same issue that may lead to a different resolution. So one of, one of those resolutions might be my own, but I am very careful to always present another way of looking at it too. Very nice. Um, Chandradeep uh, Mitra says, do you have any experience or perspective of combining ethics with marketing? Um, I'm not in the marketing, so I've not taught it, um, but I've asked to our center, our Institute for Ethics and Business, one of our things is to, uh, one of our charges is to sort of integrate the ethics across the curriculum. So I've talked to marketing faculty about this. Um, I, I do uh, get them to start by looking ethical issues that could arise in marketing. So, uh, you know, false advertising, uh, some of the, the personal data and tracking that happens in marketing, that, those kinds of things are, I think, easy. But, uh, you know, when you get into classes like consumer behavior or any intro to marketing course is gonna have a consumer behavior module, understanding how consumers behave is going to have a huge normative component to it as well because uh, part of marketing is to convince them to pay attention to your product or pay attention to what you're what you're selling how do you do that in a non-manipulative ethical manner is something that i think needs some attention in a marketing course and that might be uh, too general for your question right now, but I'm happy to have a conversation with you and look at the syllabus together if you'd like. Um, we've got, I'm gonna ask you, uh, David, that I'm, I'm gonna need a list of the resources and books so that we can put that in the blog post so people sure, can sure. get access to that. Um, so we have about five minutes left. Um, I think we have time for one more question and then closing thoughts. Um, and yes, we will be posting the video up on YouTube and I will include a link to that. Um, the emerging, uh, hold on, no, I missed one. Uh, so David had a second question. How do you help students see others' perspectives um, and help students develop empathy and compassion? And I guess my follow-up is, do, or do you? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, I'm, I'm not going to lie to you, and maybe other professors are more clever at this than I, but I, it usually takes, in a 15-week course, it usually takes two to four weeks before I can get students really comfortable opening up. Part of it is trust for me that when they say something that might be controversial, that they're not going to be reprimanded for it or chastised, and uh, that their peers in the classroom aren't going to chastise them either. I will not tolerate that, and I make that clear at the beginning, that we're all in this together, we're learning from each other, and I'm learning from them too. So they should not be afraid to give their perspective on things. I, I say, you know, the classroom door is closed, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. This is our classroom. This is our space. We're going to debate the issues. And I let them know early on that um, no one will judge you on your opinion. We, we are not in here to do that. We're here to listen to other people's perspectives and learn from them. And it takes a little bit of time 
reinforcing that argument. And I'd say after a few weeks, I've, lucky. I've had some success getting them to trust that they can get away with being honest and, and express themselves. So it takes a few weeks to get yourself to that, the group to learn polite discussion, respectful discussion about ethics. Yeah, respectful, uh, respectful individuals respectfully disagree. You know, uh, it's, it's something that's part of being at university and why they're there. I try to make sure they know that. But I think still the human aspect of it, I cannot ignore. They need a little time to trust the professor that what you're saying is actually what you're doing. Very cool. So do you have any closing thoughts or comments you want to leave us with? Well, you know, I, I normally uh, end my ethics courses by showing some very vivid uh, videos. You know, some students may have seen or heard about, but uh, not to the extent that I show them in the classroom. I'll show them uh, bits of documentaries on Milgram shock experiments, the obedience experiments, and Zimbardo's uh, prison experiments, things like this. And these are contexts that have absolutely nothing to do with business whatsoever. And when they're first watching it, they're like, why are we watching this in a business ethics classroom? I get them to look at how you have a rate of just an example, quick example here that uh, Milgram found 65% of people went to the end of the shock board to a point where they thought these participants thought they may have killed a person just by blind obedience to authority figure that had no impact on their lives whatsoever. And then I get them to think, okay, now put yourself into an organization where your boss actually does have legitimate authority over you pays you, could fire you, promote you, whatever, evaluate you, tells you to do something unethical. Think about humans' tendencies to obey blind authority to such an extreme case where people they thought were dying, and now you've just been asked to falsify some report. It's a transparency issue. It's, it's unethical, but it's breaking the law, but no one's going to die. Think about how easy it is to do that. So that I impress upon the students that they have the power to make the decisions and influence other people. And I get them to think about some of these extreme social psychology kinds of examples in a business environment. And I think that kind of personalization really does resonate with them. And I suggest that I encourage you all to branch out into different fields and disciplines to bring that into the classroom because you can get a lot out of the students that way. Well, thank you so much, David. Um, I really enjoyed this. I'm looking forward to the next one with Michael. Um, and uh, we will follow up with an email to everybody once we get the blog post and the video up and the list of resources available. I'll email everybody that um, participated or signed up for this so you have that link. Our next one is at the end of May with Michael Pearson. Um, and then in June, I think we have Elizabeth, and then I'm going to be the, the host for the one in August, I think. So um, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. It was my pleasure. Thanks for listening, folks. Appreciate your question.